Okay, so here we are in Greece, and we have these large marble sculptures that are cut away from the stone behind them. If you remember in Egyptian sculpture, the the front part of them had been carved away, but they, it seems like they were still attached to the stone on the back side. And um, in Greece, we're starting to carve away completely, so we have the body is free of the stone. Greeks are not afraid of nudity, and unlike the Egyptians the, who felt that nudity was debasing, the Greeks glorified the perfection of the human body and, and idealized it. The first, men were the only ones that were naked, and then women eventually became depicted as nude as well. But then in the beginning, in the archaic period, women were always dressed and clothed, whereas the men were naked. Um, a, a, archaic sculpture... Uh, are this new type of freestanding st structure that was either made of wood or terracotta or gold or even iron um, or bronze, uh, marble. These figures would have been brightly painted, especially located on top of a high facade or of a temple. Sculptures are often included metallic accessories like thunderbolts, harps, and various other attributes. So they would have been, in addition, made out of gold and, at and attached to the sculpture. And they sometimes bore inscriptions indicating uh, they, who they were commissioned for or what the commemorative purpose was. And they were found marking graves and sanctuaries and lined pathways from the entrance to the main temple. A female statue is called a kor, K-O-R-E, whereas the men's, the male, was a kouros, K-O-U-R-O-S, and uh, archaic kori, which is plural, were always clothed, the women, and represented deities or priestesses, whereas the kori uh, are nearly always nude and have identified as various gods, warriors, or victorious athletes, that type of thing. These figures stand frontally, both bolt upright, and boxy shoulders, rigid and natural. And they remind us of what we saw in Egypt um, when we were studying their art. So, the Anavosos, Koros, 530 BCE, marble, and he's six foot four inches, which is is a tall man, which is a tall sculpture. I don't know if men was really were really that tall at that time. Our theme is death in the afterlife. And he's powerful. He's rounded athletic body, fuller cheek on the face, and he's uh, documents a more lifelike rendering of, of the human figure um, than what we saw in Greece, or excuse me, what we saw in Egypt. Um, a little bit more naturalistic. He has a strong pose and his hair is braided, and we have an archaic smile, which is something you really need to remember from looking at archaic sculpture, is this little smile on their face. It's a closed mouth smile, and it's meant to just enliven the sculpture. His intention would have been like the crater, the geometric crater, to um, like, a, a, like a stele there um, and to mark the grave. So this was not intended to be the likeness of any one particular person. He was a symbolic type. He was a symbol of, of their warrior. Some paint still remains on him, so we know that he would have been painted in, in brightly colored uh, fashion. And so we just want to look at him. He's, it's very similar, his stance, what we saw in Egypt... Um, I wish I had put an Egyptian a sculpture next to it so we could compare the two. His hands aren't quite as relaxed as we'll see as we get into later uh, Greece, but he's not quite as, as rigid as maybe the Egyptian sculptures, but they do very much remind us of, of Egypt, except for he's naked. He has no clothes on, whereas the, um, the Egyptians always were clothed. So let's move on to the Peplos core. Just a close-up of him. Again, this just replaces the bases of the geometric period. And we touched on the video in homework, so we're not going to do that now.
And so we are in Athens. And as what happens in art history, things are named because we think we know. Uh, for instance, they, they thought this was a peplos, was what she's wearing, but in fact it's, it's something else, and I don't recall what the, the term is for what she's actually wearing. But now they've discovered that she's not wearing a peplos, but because we've known her as the peplos core for so long, she's going to remain the peplos core as far as her name because that's what we recognize her as. She is in the archaic period, 530 BCE, and she is up marble, and she's four feet tall, and our theme is humanism and classic tradition again. And she was found at the Acropolis. She most likely would have been holding um, an attribution of some sort. Uh, we're not 100% sure what, what it was or what she would have been holding. Like uh, the Kuros figure, she has a round, rounded cheeks and a naturalistic face and body, um, yet, of course, she is clothed. However, we, you know, her breasts are, are re somewhat revealed, and so we know that she's a woman, and there's the tightened belt around her waist. <coughs> she, too, is standing vertical posed, and she probably would have had a metal crown on, and she probably would have held a bow and maybe arrow in her hand. And we know from um, the paint that is left on her that this is probably the way she would have been painted or somewhat similar to this. Her missing arm would have been extended and held the attribute. And so the paint uh, would have been on the decisive parts, on the eyes, the lips, the hair, the edges of the drapery to provide accent for the marble. And so the video would have been in your homework again, so we're not going to go over that now. But you need to remember the difference between the peplos core and the koros, male and female. <clears throat>